The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. The break, it is over. Sort of. I mean, it's sort of over. We got two games tonight, which is officially the end of the All-Star break, although two games? Eh, I don't know, man. I kind of wish, and I'm kind of nitpicking a little bit here, but I kind of wish that we didn't have this weird, soft, grand opening kind of thing. It's a soft opening. Wizards, Grizz, Spurs, Mavericks, those games happening tonight. And that's fine. You know, we get back from the break. But you had to go through the whole rigmarole for two, two games. Meanwhile, tomorrow, Thursday... I think there are 11. It was a quick glance at it as I was getting ready for today's show. So what, really, what are we doing here? You're going to bring everybody back on Thursday. I don't, you just rush two teams back from the All-Star break? That seems dumb. But whatever, that's what's happening. So, you know, we're going to enjoy it, I suppose. We got basketball back. Welcome to the pod, everybody. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. I am your host, Dan Bespris. You guys know all that good stuff by now. But as I've been told a million times, and I will continue to abide by this rule, do every show as if some one person is listening for the very first time. So you can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris. Hoop ball is at hoop-ball.com. That's the URL. Or you can follow them on Twitter at hoopballfantasy, which, by the way, that's a news feed. So it's not just like site news, it's actual NBA fantasy news breaks that happen over there, and then what you should do with various pieces of information as it comes out. That's actually a really useful Twitter feed. What's been going on around here? Well, we've got our continuing Rate That Pod contest. We're just going to keep it going through the end of this week. Entrance will stop being admitted at the end of the weekend, because I know that it does take sometimes a day or two for your reviews to pop up when you submit them through iTunes or Apple Podcast app. The way around that, of course, is for you to screenshot it as you're writing the review. You don't have to wait until you then see it on the page two days later, so that is kind of a nice way for you guys to not have to deal with that. But just in case some of you submitted a review and then were like, oh, crap, I forgot to screenshot it, and then you're looking for it and it's not showing up. It does take a day or two sometimes. So we'll give that buffer region. The way this contest works, for those that haven't done it yet, if you rate and review this podcast, drop a five-star review and write something in your review, you will be entered in a contest to win actual cash dollars. Hoop Ball will be giving you money to uh, gamble with our buddies over at mybookie.ag. So all you would need to do, if you don't have an account, you'd have to open one up over there. That's free we would give you money to play with there. So a uh, pretty sweet prize coming up, and it's growing every time more people submit reviews to me to get into the contest. So let's keep this going. This is kind of last call. This week is the end of it, and then we'll draw a winner, and we will have runner-up prizes as well. So there are, even if you don't think you're going to win, ah, I never win anything, do it because uh, I'll have offers for the runner-ups also. Probably won't be quite as juicy because, you know, you want to win the contest, but we'll have other stuff going on. If you need to know how to do it, it's pretty easy. Uh, you're obviously listening to the podcast right now, so you're halfway there. If you're using Apple Podcasts on a mobile device or iTunes on a computer, search for Fantasy NBA Today. Click on the show title if you're on a mobile device. Scroll down to the bottom of that page if you're on iTunes. Click on the Rate and Review tab. Easy peasy, the whole thing Couldn't take you more than 90 seconds. Well worth it to try to win some actual cash dollars. Do it while you're doing something else. Waiting at a red light or whatever. And if you write something funny, uh, I may be so inclined to um, maybe read it on air. Because some of you guys have actually put together some relatively amusing reviews of the podcast, and I have enjoyed them. The most recent ones are... uh, you guys are mostly just being nice, which is cool. I like when you guys are nice to me. That touches the old heart, but uh, when I see the funny ones, I'm 
probably going to read them. Most of you guys are just making fun of me for not for deleting a podcast. <laughs> and then one of you asked if Mitchell Robinson was a stash. And the answer is, yeah, he shouldn't have been dropped anyway. So let's dive on into this thing. Um, today's show, as I previewed on yesterday's podcast, is going to be more about the second half of the season from a head-to-head perspective. Yesterday, we did an ultra and longer than I intended deep dive on ways that you could use game discrepancy in Roto Leagues to try to cash in. Trading guys that have 35, 34 games left for guys that have 37 or 38 or even 40 games left in the case of the Spurs and the Grizzlies. And that was about utilizing your Roto Games cap properly, whatever it may be. Assuming you have about 72 games to use at each position, you want to make sure that the games you're using there are the best values, but also there's very real cutoffs because as we talked about on yesterday's show again, and this is this is Roto strategy, we're going to pivot to head-to-head for today's podcast, but for Roto, to use those 72 games up, you might have a guy on your team who's played, what did we talk about already? Like your Clippers, Clippers have had 38 games. I know Kawhi and Paul George, they didn't play all 38, they're really not all that close to that number but they only have 34 games left. So what's worth more to your fantasy team? 34 games of Paul George or 40 games of, say, DeMar DeRozan or something like that. We talked about, we compared DeMar to LeBron on yesterday's podcast. And while that one, you know, you could make the side argument that maybe LeBron gets better in the second half of the year as he starts to ramp up towards playoff mode or whatever that happens to be, he's still putting up pretty big numbers and things are just kind of depressed because he has a little more help. He's getting older, all of that stuff. I mean, doesn't seem to age. Not really the point of this discussion. Why was that important for Roto? Well, sometimes with a games cap, if you only have like 30 games left to use up at a particular roster slot, you're going to want to use your best 30. So there, you might not want to trade down. But also, the other side of this is, everybody in the NBA these days has multi-position eligibility. So you actually get more by getting 40 games out of a DeMar than 34 or 35 out of a LeBron James. Because you could spend 38 of them in one roster slot, and you could spend two in another. And it's better, this is the key point, than the 34, 35 games you get out of the slightly better per-game guy, plus whatever fill-in guy you use to round that out. Head-to-head is very different. I know you guys are thinking, Dan, get to the freaking head-to-head part already. Head-to-head is very different because if a guy misses a game, it's just gone. You can't make that up later. Like with Roto, if a guy sits out a ball game, it doesn't count against your game's cap. You can find another guy to drop into that slot later on in the year. Head-to-head, maxing out games played is of the utmost importance. It's actually less important to have the overall best per game guy. It's more important to have the guy that racks up the better totals numbers. And so when you look at the second half of the season, I don't recommend making some of the judgment calls we made on yesterday's podcast. I think one of them was like, uh, we were debating, hmm was the example on yesterday's show where it was like, okay, uh, what if this guy gets to 22 games? Or what if this guy gets to 23 games? You want the guy that's compiling. And in head-to-head, when referring back to the strategy we've been talking about since yesterday, there are advantages to making moves for guys who have uh, more games remaining who are beyond that top 30 or top 40. Let me go into a little bit more of the theory on this angle as well. I mean, this is deep dive stuff this week, but you know what? You get theoretical discussions over the All-Star break. That's just how it goes. You're stuck with it. Hate me if you want. Call me pedantic if you want. I think this is helpful. The reason that this is important is, and the reason that in head-to-head you can actually extend your window, your breadth of players you should be exploring, is is because of what we just talked about a minute ago. In Roto... There is a set, a finite number of games that you can use up over the course of the season. 
which is why I kept saying, like, well, if you have 36 games of the number 40 guy versus 30 games of the number 30 guy, which one is actually better? Well, you actually you have to think it's 30 of the number 30 guy, or whatever we talked about there, plus six games from a fill-in guy. Because in Roto, like we were just talking about, you can make up those games elsewhere. In head-to-head, there is no fill-in. If a guy misses a game, it's just dead. And so now, when you compare, you know, uh, this again is a hypothetical, but it's I think it's important. I think it's useful for us to pick up real names on the podcast while we're talking about this stuff. Uh, Bobby Portis and Mason Plumley, we talked about on yesterday's show. Very tight in value so far this year. Portis is number 98 on a per-game basis. Plumley is number 99 on a per-game basis. For all intents and purposes, they've had the exact same value on a per-game basis so far this year. The difference in those two guys is that Portis has played two additional games. And because of that, by totals, Portis is number 65 and Plumlee is number 74. I gave you two of the exact same player. When it comes to value, I know that their stat sets are not exactly the same, but by value to this point in the year, they have been the exact same player. The guy who played two extra games is nearly a full round ahead. Three quarters of a round ahead of the guy who played two fewer games. And this is with two dudes that were relatively healthy for all intents and purposes. You know, we didn't see Mason Plumley missing a bunch of ball games. Portis just happened to play in all 36 of the Bucks games so far, and Plumley played in 34 of the Pistons' 36 games. If I had given you those numbers, if I had said, oh, these two guys playing, they have the exact same value, one's in 36, one's in 34 games, you'd probably say, meh, that's a wash. And in Roto, you'd be right. In Roto, you'd be right, because you'd be able to fill in those two extra games that Plumlee didn't play with someone ranked in the 100 range, and so they would, actually. That combination, Plumlee plus two, would have the exact same value, or maybe even slightly ahead of Portis at 36 games. But in head-to-head, Portis wins. Which is why, and I'm not going to go through every player on each of these teams like we did yesterday, but it's why, uh, in head-to-head, loading up even on fringe Spurs and Grizzlies is actually a good idea. Who are guys that... I, I think that's probably the next question that would come up, right? Who are the guys on these teams that you would call fringy that you should be loading up on? The Grizzlies are an entire team of fringe players at this point. Uh, Slow Mo is has been uh, better than fringe. JV has been better than fringe. Brandon Clark has been ever so slightly better than fringe. So I, I, I think I can probably exclude those guys, although I've had a lot of questions. Should I drop Brandon Clark? Dude, he's four slots behind Jonas Valanciunas. I haven't had any questions about whether you should drop JV. You guys need to look at value, look at ranking. Don't look at who's scoring and rebounding more with this stuff. Uh, But digging a little deeper on the Grizzlies, and I I hate his stat set. And remember, folks, we're talking exclusively head-to-head today. Because in Roto, you could not pay me enough to start Dylan Brooks for a ballgame. But Dylan Brooks with 40 games the rest of the way... And he's got a very real shot to play in most of them. He's relatively durable, doesn't miss that many ballgames. You know, one or two here and there. But if he's getting two or three more games than other guys uh, that you'd be considering that maybe even are a little bit ranked in front of him, because Brooks right now is 133? Yeah, he's at 133 right now. And if you're comparing number 133 in... Well, what's a good example here? Grizzlies have played 32 games. They have 40 left. If you're comparing him to someone who's actually closer to value on one of those teams we talked about yesterday, the Lakers, the Clippers, the Warriors, the Nets, the Knicks, these teams that have played 37 or 38 games, you're talking about a five or six game bump from that roster slot. Who's in that range from those teams right now? And I'm going to go above. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lunge forward and look for guys on uh, those teams. Montrez Harrell is number 103. By all accounts, 
And I actually don't know the answer to what, what I'm about to do live on air. So it could, it could completely blow up in my face. And if it does, it'll tell us that we need to get these guys a little bit closer. Montrezl Harrell's number 103. Dylan Brooks is number 133. Let's say that the rest of the way, you're comparing the a guy around top 100 in 34 or 35 games versus a guy who's about number 130 in 40 games, a difference of five-ish games. So let's do that example with someone else where it's a little easier to find. Like uh, Evan Fournier has played in 21 games. Who's someone in the 130s that's played in 26 games? Paul Millsap. Those guys are farther apart than I intended. Millsap is number 139. He's played in 26 games. Fournier is number 104. He's played in 21 games. So where do they fall on totals rankings? Uh, Evan Fournier is number 180. Paul Millsap is number 165. Fantastic. The example worked. Thank the good Lord, because I didn't want to have to go back and redo that entire section of the podcast. Paul Millsap, who's ranked 35 slots behind Evan Fournier on per-game value, and in a 1,000 light years, no one would tell you to drop Evan Fournier for Paul Millsap. This is just an example of what's happened in the first half of the year, two guys that have been injured, but... We needed a five-game gap. Millsap is ahead of Fournier by a round and a quarter. So you're talking about from going 35 down to 15 up. That's a 50-slot leap. And I know what you are saying, and you should be saying it. You should be saying, Dan, neither one of those guys has put up head-to-head fantasy value the first half of the year. So find me a better example of guys that have. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper in that same neck of the woods. Uh, Fournier was 21. Draymond Green was 31 games at number 105, so he actually has had value. Josh Hart is 36 games at number 127. I bet you this one's closer. Again, we're going to do it live on air. Uh, Draymond, 94 by totals. Josh Hart, 87 by totals. So again, two guys that were separated by about 25 slots. The lower-ranked per-game guy had played five additional ball games, and he passed him by seven, about half a round in front. So from 25 down to seven up, basically, is almost a three-round swing on those five games. This is a much better example because both of these guys, the first half of the season, have been head-to-head values. Both of those guys. Not values in the sake that they were underdrafted or something to that effort, They've been head-to-head values, meaning they should have been started the entire first half in head-to-head leagues. They would have been useful for your fantasy team. My cutoff is I like to look in a 12-team league that's relatively competitive. I'm hoping I can get all of my guys inside the top 100. That's my target. That doesn't mean trade super high-ranked guys for, you know, to, to create more top 100 dudes. I'm just saying I want to somehow figure out a way to get the guys towards the end of my bench to be guys that are inside the top 100 or real damn close to it. It's hard. It's a, it's a lofty goal, and it's almost impossible. And if you do it, you're probably going to win. But the point here is both of those guys should have been started. And amazingly, the Dylan Brooks of the group, Josh Hart in this instance, was ranked ahead of the, the top 100 guy. The reason we go into this excruciating and painful detail, and I know many of you are like, Dan, enough, get to the goddamn point already. The reason we're talking about this is that maybe Dylan Brooks isn't the best example. He's got 40 games left. You know, who's the guy that he's punching out of the way on your team? But maybe he is. And DeAnthony Melton, who's right at the edge of the top 100 on a per-game basis with 40 games left, absolutely in head-to-head. So let's play the game. Today, we're going to look at the teams, the five, the six teams we talked about yesterday, that have low games totals and guys that get a weird boost in head-to-head formats that you otherwise think might not. I'm not talking about playoff formats today, and I hope that wasn't the indication from yesterday's show because everybody's playoffs run at different times. And uh, there's no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at the end of the NBA schedule this year because that's when the play-in tournament is happening midweek they still want to start the playoffs by the weekend so they have to have the play-in tournament midweek meaning they can't have that weird 10-day week 
at the end of the year. By the way, this is great. I prefer this. Season ends on a Sunday, as it should be. April, or sorry, May the 16th is the last day of the regular season. It doesn't extend into the middle of the week. Thank the good Lord. I hope they continue to do this, although I am skeptical. I guess as long as there's a play-in tournament, they'll probably keep that, but no, we may see play-in tournament disappear. So if your league is going to the end of the season, just pull up a damn screen, uh, schedule grid. They're available all over the place. Hoopball has one for our Fantasy Pass subs, does a wonderful job of just outlining team schedules. Spurs have 13 games their last three weeks. Uh, Grizzlies have 13 games their last three weeks. The Mavericks have 13 games their last three weeks, even though uh, the Mavs have 38 games left. So they managed to sort of backload their remaining games. And then there's a lot of teams that have 12, which is why I don't get too caught up in it. The teams that have 10... Yeah, those are probably trouble. The Clippers only have 10. I think that might actually be the only one. I think the Clippers are the only team with 10. And there's a a bunch with 11. And then there's a crap ton with 12. And then the three teams I mentioned with with 13. So that all is useful. But you're not making massive shifts to your team based on that. It's much easier in points leagues. Because then you're just targeting the guys with the most games. In category formats, head-to-head, by the end of the year, you should really be starting to isolate your six or seven best categories and strengthening those for a playoff run. So you're not just going to flip guys who might have an extra ball game. It's how you're going to stream guys. We're going to be looking at that as we get closer to the playoffs. But then some of you might not have the last week in your playoffs. So then you roll it back a week earlier and uh, the Mavericks suddenly and the Thunder suddenly are two teams that have some of the better schedules. So it, it the whole thing blows up in your face if you're exclusively looking at it from that perspective. So that's not what we're doing on today's podcast. This is about exploiting games played the rest of the way in a head-to-head format. Folks, I want to tell you about our buddies over at Manscaped.com. They continue to be a wonderful organization to work with, and I really want you guys to check out their products. They have the Lawn Mower 3.0 Pinch Free Sideburn Trimming Technology. The pinnacle of male grooming. Built-in LED lights. You can illuminate the parts of your face or body that you are trimming. Also already mentioned pinch-free. That's the most important part. It's waterproof and with a 90-minute battery life. Sleek little son of a gun with a little charging dock. It's awesome. That's the Lawnmower 3.0. When you check out the stuff at manscaped.com, use promo code HOOPBALL20 while checking out to get 20% off and free shipping on your order. Beautiful stuff. They've got the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, the Shears luxury nail kit, boxers, t-shirts, and right now proceeds from all of their sales are going to the Testicular Cancer Society to fight cancer. Come on. Good company, great product, doing good things. What more could you ask for? Again, promo code over there is HoopBall20 for 20% off and free shipping on your manscaped.com order. Check it out today. So, Dan, where are the cutoffs? Where are the cutoffs? And that's a great question because it is a bit team and league dependent. But for 12 teamers, the, we'll start with the Grizzlies and the Spurs because they have 40 games left, and that gives them this colossal edge over other teams. Everyone as far down the line as Dylan Brooks is a guy that you should be targeting in your head-to-head leagues. Brooks, obviously John Morant, who's going to be over-rostered for where he's ranked, DeAnthony Melton, Brandon Clark, JV, Kyle Anderson, and JJJ, who will turn up at some point. But he should be rostered because he's going to be good on a per-game basis, not because he's going to rack up stats the rest of the way. He's the guy you roster in head-to-head if you're loading up for your playoff run. Right now, with a, a handful of weeks left before the playoffs, you're loading up on just overall totals. So there is another element to this that I'll I'll talk about a little bit more at the end. The other element to this is, does this become a streaming slot when you hit the playoffs? And the answer is probably. Although, as we just talked about, Memphis with their 13 games, if you're rolling all the way to the end of the line, that's a big deal. 
The Spurs, I'm going to do this part relatively fast because this is less theory and this is something you guys could probably figure out on your own. DeMar DeRozan, DeJounte Murray, Derek White, Keldon Johnson, yes, even LaMarcus Aldridge, and Jakob Pertl all should be rostered here at least for the foreseeable future because, again, of their very thick upcoming schedule. Spurs have four games every single week and then five that last week of the playoffs. Grizzlies, exact same thing. So when you're getting four games from a guy every single week, yeah, you could use that slot as a streaming slot. If you're in a weekly league, it's useful because you're going to get the most games you possibly could. And what I'll tell you right now is you can also use these slots as kind of what I like to call long streamers, where you don't actually have to rotate them in and out if you don't want to. You can turn other slots into streaming opportunities because you've now picked up a guy on a team that just has a ton more games than the other dudes you were talking about. Like, and this is what we're talking about with the Lakers. And and yeah, you could probably trade Montrez Harrell and get something as opposed to just dropping him outright. But I would rather have these guys with five more games than the Lakers because of the discrepancy we just talked about. Credit, by the way, to Montrez, who hasn't missed a game yet. That's actually a pretty big deal. Uh... But, you know, the Clippers, they've had, they've had 38 games so far. Evita Zubats has minimal value in 34 games. Patrick Beverly, minimal value. Sergi Baca, not a ton of value in 34 games. Although, yeah, you start him when they have good weeks. But that might turn the Clippers, if you can hold on to Ibaka through this two-gamer and then next week's three-gamer, then he's got four, four weeks in a row. But his schedule after that is pretty terrible. Surge with three games in a week, three weeks in a row. Almost any of these other dudes is more useful that we were just talking about. Guys ranked 15, 20 slots behind him, and they just have one more game than him every single week. The rest of the way. The last four weeks, the Clippers have 13 games. The Spurs, who we just talked about, have 17. That's a massive, massive jump. So Surge is going to run out of value. The Warriors, Andrew Wiggins, is not really going to be a value the rest of the way. I would argue Steph, Kelly Oubre, and Draymond, you guys, you can start those guys even though they don't have as many games because they're both kind of trending up. Uh, Oubre and, and Green, I should say. But Wiggins is at 128 right now with a bad schedule the rest of the way. The Brooklyn Nets, guys like Jeff Green, DeAndre Jordan, guys on the periphery. I think you're good with Harris... And then obviously the three superstars on that team you're good with. But we spent so much time talking about these guys as streamers that they're about to hit a rough scheduling patch. They've got two this week, four next, and they go three, four, three, a couple of fours in a row. And then they've got another three mixed in in their playoffs. What about the Knicks? They've also played 37 games so far. Have they run their course? Luckily for us, the Knicks don't have that many fringe guys. But, yeah, Derrick Rose suddenly becomes way less interesting in head-to-head. What if he sits out a game? They're already down to only 35 games left. I still like Nerlens and Mitchell Robinson just because I like them a lot. And you guys know I play more Roto. But, yeah, I mean, Nerlens Noel, you're riding him here. But an argument could be made that once Robinson's back and Noel is more like, you know, 90 to 100 range... And the Knicks suddenly have a back-to-back three-gamer in mid-April. Does that become your streaming slot? It's a possibility. They have six games over those two weeks. There are plenty of teams that have eight. Nobody with nine, by the way. So maybe not quite as significant. Quickly here, the other names on the uh, under... The, the, the teams that have played f- too few games. By the way, Larry Markkinen. Sounds like he's probable for the Bulls game out of the break. Uh, I'm still sticking with Dad Young. Wendell Carter Jr. you're sticking with. Otto Porter might be playing out of the break. I don't think I'm grabbing him beforehand. We can talk about some more of this stuff on tomorrow's show because I really wanted to focus almost exclusively on the sort of head-to-head element of having more games played. Uh, but I think Wendell Carter Jr. fits the bill, fits the mold of the guy that really hasn't been good enough so far this year to use on a night-to-night basis, but with five games over, 
some of the other guys he might be competing against for your last roster slot, he wins out. What about the Wizards? Eh. I don't know that anybody actually gets up and over that hump. They're all so bad that even with the extra games, it doesn't really cut it. I'm sticking with Davis Bertans. It's a nice reason to have him on your roster with 38 games left. But, you know, Rui's outside the top 200. And then, unfortunately, everybody's sort of stuck playing Russell Westbrook at this point. And I do still think he's been a little bit better. The free throw percent has been so awful that I, you know, I don't know anybody saw 58% coming. He's been downright atrocious in that department. But then, hey, we pivot to Dallas. Jalen Brunson has been worth using over that stretch. Tim Hardaway Jr., even Josh Richardson, Dorian Finney-Smith, Maxi Kleba, all of these guys, if they're actually healthy and playing, you could make an argument should be used because of their great schedule. I don't want to I don't want to tell you that you have to because a lot of it is about using them where they're where the the schedule is clustered best. But if you're in a weekly league or and this is something I love to do or if you're trying to create more streaming slots this is one of my favorite strategies. You guys know I love to long stream. In the playoffs in particular I think that you can stream, if you have four moves a week, I think you could stream as many as three. And you're like, Dan, how the hell can you do that? Well, one of those guys should just be someone you pick up because, you know, they might have like four games in six days. They're they're streaming them for six days. A stream doesn't have to be two days or one day. So here's your four moves. You pick up one guy on Monday who has four games between Monday and Saturday. You save one move for Sunday. Hopefully someone else on your team, like you planned the previous week so that you have a couple of guys that play Monday and Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, you trade those two guys out with your second and third roster moves for guys who play four times between Wednesday and Sunday. Or maybe you do it with guys that play four times between Tuesday and Sunday, something like that. So now you've used three of your four moves, and you've created probably three to four additional games on your team. And you can use another move on Sunday. And if you planned beforehand... So this is why I think the long stream is a vastly underutilized thing. A lot of folks, they use all four of their moves on one streaming slot. The most you can get out of that is seven games from your one streaming slot in a week. Did you turn a three-gamer into a seven-gamer with four moves in that one roster slot? Yeah, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. But guess what? If you had a three-gamer coming into the week and you could trade him out for a five-gamer with one move, then you could try to make three extra games out of the other three moves or four extra games out of the other three moves. You should be trying to average more than one game gained for every streaming roster move you make, which is why I love this idea of just streaming a San Antonio Spur for like nine weeks. Is that what's left in the season? Eight or nine weeks? They have 40 damn games left, people. 40. You don't have to exchange them for anyone the rest of the way because they have more games than every other team in the league except for a couple every single week. There is not one week between now and the end of the year when the Spurs or the Grizzlies have fewer games played than any other team in the NBA. The worst case scenario for these teams right now. Sorry, that was a mis- That was a misprint. Uh... There is one week where a couple other teams have five and the Spurs have four. But other than one spot, the Spurs, you can just ride them the whole way through. Now you can just stream a Spur for basically like six weeks in a row. And then you'll run into, I think Detroit has a five-gamer at some point in the middle of April. And that's probably the next thing you're running into. Do the Lakers have a five-gamer coming up next week? All right, fine. Start your Spurs stream after that. Okay? Start your Grizz stream after that. Stream a Laker next week and then abandon ship. So that's what I want you guys focusing on here coming out of the All-Star break. You're looking at the end of your head-to-head bench. And I don't know who you might have there. You might have someone who's playing okay. 
you might have someone that you feel decent about. Uh, you're hoping that there's some upside there. Um, I don't know who the hell it might be. You're you you're still hoping that uh, Jeff Green gets that center job back when he returns from the All Star break. But you know what? I got bad news for you guys. Even if he does, Nets don't have enough games left. Dump him. Dump him. They've only got two games this week. Plenty of teams have three. Dump him for a Grizzly. There are other teams that have three games this week, but if you dump him for a Grizz, you don't have to exchange him for anyone else for a month and a half. I want to continue this discussion on Twitter because I think it's too long, actually, to have in one 30- or 40-minute podcast. There's too many names that you can plan for. What I will say here that... I don't know that it puts a bow on things, and I don't, there, there's a million different ways you can orchestrate this, but it all comes down to using your weekly moves effectively. And if you just turn one roster slot into a spur or a grizz, basically the rest of the way, you clear out other slots for additional streaming. Now, if your team is just stacked from head to toe, none of this discussion matters, and you probably didn't need to be listening to this podcast anyway. But... I can use my own team as an example. I have a team with Jeff Green. If I turn him into a uh, a Spur or a Grizz today, uh, then I'll just go to my second worst player. And that now becomes my streaming slot, which is awesome. I just gained games on everyone I'm playing against for the next month and a half. Two months. With one roster move. One move. Right? Isn't that what we were just talking about? You want to make sure you're gaining at least one game played against your opponent with every move you make. By dropping one Brooklyn Net and picking up one Memphis Grizzly, you are gaining a game effectively in five upcoming weeks. With one move, you've gained five games against your opponents. And I know it doesn't all happen at the same time. But this is actually a really good example because uh, you gained one this week. You gained one the week of March 22nd. You gained one the week of April 5th. Uh, You gained one the week of May the 3rd and the very last week of the year. One move. You gained a game in five different weeks against yourself. That's helpful no matter how you slice it. Guys, go get a fantasy pass so you can check out the streaming chart when that comes out. It's going to be so useful when we're really digging in on this stuff. When we're when I'm teaching you as we approach the playoffs and work through them, when I'm teaching you all how to long stream, how to turn four weekly moves into three streaming slots, we're going to win our playoffs this year because we're going to have more games than the people we're playing against. Let's go ahead and put a pin in this. I want to do it on Twitter. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to remind everybody in my brain, not what it used to be these days. Um, we can talk playoffs if you want, but I didn't want to get that far ahead of things right now because I think a, a lot of folks, these episodes, like talking about this type of stuff, this theory, this is not for the team that is 15 games out in first place. This is for winning your weekly matchups the rest of the way and making sure you have a good playoff spot in your head-to-head league, or getting into the playoffs in your head-to-head league, all right? Because I know one of the things that I think people are going to are, are thinking at the end of this episode is, why did I listen to this? I'm winning. Uh, yeah, it, you know, this doesn't have the pick-up-drop stuff that you're probably looking to, uh, to power boost your team. If you're crushing everyone, you should just be stream, uh, stashing people at this point, just loading up for your playoff push, or, you know, if you're in Roto, loading up on guys who have terrific per game upside that's easy it's easy to be way out in first place it's hard to fight back and this has been a tough year because of injuries and postponements so there's a lot of weird little stuff going on i've got a head-to-head team that's just clobbering people and i have another head-to-head team that's just dead last and it's almost exclusively because uh of postponements and injuries and the fact that i have devin booker as one of my top picks in one uh and bradley beal as one of my top picks in the other. Like, that's all it takes in a weird year like this one. So I hope this was somewhat useful in just analyzing 
what it means to get five extra games out of a player in a head-to-head as you're compiling stats the rest of the way. You want guys that are playing, and you want guys that are just rolling up stats with a ton of ball games and not that many missed opportunities for basketball games as well. Last call again this week. Leave a uh, review on the podcast. Screenshot it at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or email it to Team Hoop Ball with hoop, at hoop-ball.com with subject line podcast review or rate and review contest or something that'll be very easy for me to find in our uh, Team Hoop Ball bucket, the email address. Do it, do it, do it, do it. And if you sign up, by the way, with mybookie.ag with promo code HOOPBALL at the third screen and screenshot that to me when you make your first deposit, I may have a, a, uh, a gift for you on that side as well. Enjoy the return of NBA tonight, everybody. We've got two games. Here's the quickie breakdown on those. Who cares? No, that's not right. Uh, plenty of people care, but from a gambling standpoint, blech, Wizards at Grizzlies. Um, you know, I, I think that most guys are back with the exception of JJJ in that ball game. So fantasy-wise, you're just sort of looking at how the minute distribution works. Sounds like Grayson Allen might still be dealing with a concussion. So I probably would fire up DeAnthony Melton in a games cap format. You're definitely firing him up in in head to head unlimited, as we just talked about. And the Spurs and Mavericks. I mean, these are this game, by the way, is f- these two games are four teams that undershot. That's why uh, me complaining at the beginning of the podcast was kind of dumb because these are four teams that had games postponed. They basically just had to schedule them in a day early. Spurs. I believe everybody is good to go, except there's one guy still out. Now I already forgot who it was, but it sounds like Derek White is expected to go. It sounds like Rudy Gay is expected to go. So uh, most of the Spurs are back in business. We will see on starting lineups now. Remember, they were basically missing their power forwards. Keldon Johnson played before the break. Uh, Rudy Gay is the other one. I, I really like Derek White as someone to try to go get before... He ramped back up to full speed for San Antonio. But Jakob Pertl's a guy to watch. LaMarcus Aldridge, same thing as we get a feel for what that team is going to be doing with their guys in the second half of the season. Uh, And the Mavericks. Jalen Brunson's been amazing. Did the All-Star break take some of the lava-hot shooting away from him? We don't know. Perhaps we'll find out. This game could be clunky. You know, none of these teams have played in a week. Wizards are playing well prior to the break. Actually, all of these teams were playing okay prior to the All-Star break. So... Uh, We'll see how that goes. Well, they were the most rested teams prior to the break. (laughs) Not playing as many games as everybody else. Mavericks, other than Brunson, uh, not not a great deal. You know, it seems like Jalen's emergence has kind of pushed Tim Hardaway Jr. and Josh Richardson down the board. Not that either one of them was that great to begin with, but at least Hardaway was right on the edge, and he's fallen off a bit. And uh, then the other question there is, do the Mavericks pick up anybody at the trade deadline or the buyout market trade deadline two weeks from tomorrow. And so that's a good segue to tomorrow's podcast. Tomorrow, we will obviously recap these two games from Wednesday night. But I want to talk a little bit about trade deadline ideas, names that may surface when you should be considering them, and then a big Thursday preview as we get back to the normal grind before Friday. Yeah, we'll do a week in review, but it'll really just be two days in review and get you situated for the weekend. Enjoy it, everybody. NBA's back. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.